Well, welcome back to Inside the Pastor Study Podcast. I'm Pastor Jeremy. And I'm Pastor George. And we are a father and son pastoral team serving a local church in Methuen, Massachusetts. And uh, it's great to be back in front of the podcast mics. I was trying yes. to remember how this whole thing worked. Yeah, it's a little, it was a little difficult. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's been a yeah. while. We uh, we took a bit of a, a leave of absence, I guess, so yes. to speak here. Yes. Yeah, it's, you know, it. The whole point of this podcast is you get to be a fly on the wall of what it's like to be in pastoral ministry, to hear some of the things that pastors talk about when they're not in the pulpit or they're not behind a lectern or, you know, leading a Bible study. And um, a bit of what that means is like from the middle of December, it it starts kind of at the end of Thanksgiving, (laughs) but particularly from the middle of December through maybe the middle of January, things get very busy. Um, And in our in, in our world, we actually, you know, we, we went through the Christmas season, which was wonderful. And then we all went on vacation. Right. Which um, is what we commonly have done yeah. is, is take January. The, yeah. Take the, some vacation January time vacation in January. Time. Yeah. And so. Sometimes uh, people even get married in January. I know. And that throws things <laughs> off too. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we, we did all of that. We, we went through Christmas season. We all went on vacation. Um, my wife and I ran some races, and uh, I ran a race. Well, you ran your first five k, yes. which is awesome. I don't know if it's called running. Well, you but... ran, you know, the like ten yards across the finish line. I did. That happened. I did. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so yes, yeah. So we got to do all those adventures, get some um, renewal, and uh, we're back. And yes. it's good to be back. I've missed this. It's been. Um, it's really the podcast has become um, something that I look forward to, and it, it's good to be back. And uh, I'm glad that those of you who are out there listening or watching us on uh, YouTube are, are back as well. And uh, this, one of the things I've noticed, Should we tell them that they need to do all. Of yeah, the things? I was going to say once. One of the things I've noticed um, just by checking metrics when I do that occasionally um, is that you know when we take time off, so do our listeners, obviously. Oh. And uh, so uh, for those of you who are subscribed, whether that be the um, YouTube version or the uh, um, through your podcast app, this just loaded and you're like, oh, cool, it's back. Um, but not everybody subscribes and you have to come looking for the uh, podcast. And so you may have just lost us. And so um, sending the podcast around to some friends Good would idea. be helpful to uh, let uh, people who normally watch be aware that we're back. Subject line. Um, they're back. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Send a text message and throw the link in. Um, but yeah, interacting with the podcast at some level really helps expand it. And we want this to expand. We, we think do. it's helpful. We, yeah. we put a lot of time and effort into it and uh, we want that to multiply. So send it around would be a great gift to us. So thanks. Thanks. Um, so one of the things we do, uh, for those of you who are new, because a friend of yours just sent this podcast to you, and uh, you're watching or listening to us for the very first time, is we begin each episode with a theological term of the week. I gotta find a button for that. I have a button for it. Here it goes. <laughs> the theological term of the week. This week's term is baptism. Ooh. Yeah. I, it, yeah. See, we're so rusty. I couldn't. I have a button that controls all this stuff. I couldn't find it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So baptism is baptism. a good word to start off on when we're coming back. Yes. yes. Because it's probably one of the more controversial theological concepts in the history of the church. Absolutely. In fact, there are now people who suddenly have turned up the volume because they're saying, He's going to talk about baptism. This is a word I need to know. Yeah. Right. And it's one of those, it, it, man, I, it is one of those words that really still distinguishes so much about what a church believes, right? Yes, yes, it does. Um, because baptism, in its original word, right? You can hit this. Yes. You're the guy who does right. this. So, so the original word, yeah. baptism, <laughs> comes from the Greek word baptizo. Mm-hmm. I the, see where they got that thing. Yeah, yeah, by the time we got to English. So by the time you work into uh, uh, King James authorizing uh, the churches of England and Scotland to actually make an authorized translation of the scripture. And even when you go back a little bit to John Wycliffe and his unauthorized translation mm, of mm-hmm. the scripture, you have already gotten into so much um, so much heat over the word baptizo that what they did in translating the word is they just said, we're not going to translate it we're just going to take the Greek letters and make a new English word out of it. So baptizo is the Greek word, and they just turned it into baptism and uh, to baptize. That's all it is. Yeah. They they didn't want to go there. They didn't want to touch it. It was already such a heated, difficult 
thing and the goal of the King James divines is what they're called it's a it was a team of of scholars that uh, were authorized in to make a single Bible translation in English that would unite the Church of England and the Church of Scotland because King James the first of England was also King James the fifth of Scotland, mm -hmm. and it was a first effort to unite the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Wales. So let's make one translation that unites everybody, but the word baptizo was going to divide everybody, so they just they just left it. Hmm. So we have this word baptism, or baptize, and it's uh, in, in some some situations it's going to be a sacrament. We talked about that word the last time we were here. So Yeah, you may need to go back and just check the beginning You may need to go back and recheck that. that, right? Yeah. Sacrament, a thing that makes a person holy. So in some in some areas, baptism, in some churches, baptism is a thing that provides holiness. Right. We can talk about that in a second or two. We follow more of a congregational or Baptist line of thinking and say that those these works of God or works of the believer don't make a person holy. They demonstrate obedience, and so they are called ordinances, coming from the Latin word ordo, meaning work. Mm -hmm. So they are works of faithfulness. Right. So, and... You so know, there's the kind of, so that you don't have to go back to the previous episode. There's the we lined there's it the up, for you. yeah, right. the distinction. Yeah, yeah. So baptism is a work of faithfulness or a work of obedience mm -hmm. that a believer does to demonstrate his relationship with God. From our perspective, from our our congregational Probably. Protestant view, yeah. Um, and there are so many things about this word that. We probably could do multiple episodes just on the word baptism. The, we could do we could do a series on the history of baptism. We right? could do a series. Yes, it would be an interesting series. Yeah. actually. Yeah, because you, yeah, we do. You have um, so there. Are, in most people's thinking, right, there are two main two modes main of baptism, modes of but baptism. there's actually a third. There is. Um, but the two main modes of baptism you have, you have infant baptism, right, and then you have adult baptism, adult baptism, right, and, and then. And, there's a third one, which is a fusion. It's called a fusion, right? So, I mean, and the, the modality is different there, right? Because if you've got a child, normally mm -hmm. they take a little bit of water and they sprinkle it on the child, mm -hmm. and that accomplishes uh, another term, pedo baptism, mm -hmm. right? Whereas baptism by believers can be by sprinkling, mm -hmm. but most often it's by immersion, by putting the person under the water. Uh, the third form is a form you don't hear much of, and it's called a fusion. Mm -hmm. uh, s um, everyday vernacular, it's pouring. Yeah. So you see that periodically. Uh, I was just saying that uh, one of the bigger practicers of a fusion uh, in American culture is the uh, the Mennonite movement, mm -hmm. which is hilarious because the Mennonite movement is an early Anabaptist movement. Yeah. So they practice a they practice believers' baptism, but it's by pouring. So they'll take a, a cup of water and pour it over the individual's head, and that accomplishes the task of uh, of baptism in their thinking. Yeah, I had a friend in uh, college who wrote a paper on baptism, the modes of baptism, and his uh, he talked about a time in New York City when there was um, where they had opened the uh, fire hydrants and. Uh, in for a group baptism moment you know a group of people were there to express their faith in jesus so they opened the fire hydrants and he said the people in the front were immersed um <laughs> a few rows back they were you know infused and all the way in the back they, they were, sprinkled, were sprinkled yeah right uh, so uh but this you know so you have these uh, three modes and i think and then you have kind of these two lines of thought you have the 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 baptism that is for somebody who is acknowledging an act of God in their life. Right. And then you have the other mode, which happens with children, that right. is acknowledging um, a, a dedication of a child into the faith. Right. Um, and, right. Um, and so one of the things that I've noticed over the years in this, and you can kind of correct this, is, you know, 
often we'll use the same word to talk about two very different things. Yes. And we've created conflict because we're using the same word to talk about two different things. Yes, exactly. And I have friends in like the Presbyterian movement right. who will sprinkle their children. Children. And they'll they'll tie that into like Jesus's presentation at the temple, yes, and or um, you know as an infant and tying into that, tie act, it into circumcision, right, and tie yes. it into the act of circumcision. And I say, well, we do the exact same thing. We just call it um, baby dedication. baby dedications, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And so there, you know, there is that confusion that starts off early, but then yeah. there, there are others, right? Yeah. So so actually, you've you've oversimplified, which is fine. That's kind of what I do. So yeah, it's what it. Guys like me just tend to take things apart. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know. So um, there are two forms of pedo baptism mm. or, or infant baptism. Um, the the one you mentioned, which is the Presbyterian mode, the more Protestant mode, mm-hmm. which is a presentation of a child to be part of the church. Um, and a commitment of the church to be in that commitment. child's life. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And and what they're operating under is actually a concept called a covenant mm-hmm. where because your parents have this covenant with God, um, mom and dad expressing their desire for their child to have that same covenant, they present their child and they open them up to the covenant. This is, yeah. this is what Martin Luther actually said, interestingly enough, as a Lutheran, he said, he said uh, that baptism isn't salvific; it doesn't save, but it is it is opening that child up to his parents' faith and inviting God to identify with that child and identify the parents' faith in leading that child. Sure, Which we is, do yeah. we do kind of do that with our in, with our with baby dedications. dedications. Sure, but then the flip side of that would be kind of like the Catholic mode of infant baptism, where you are baptizing them into the church and into the community. Well, and there's another side of that because there's. Uh, another term, right, called semi-Pelagianism. Mm-hmm. And in Catholicism, what you are identifying is that that child is born in sin. Mm-hmm. But you need to do something about that sin before the child grows grows older. So in it, they they don't discount the reality of original, skin, of original sin, mm-hmm. but they take that child and that child is baptized into the church to wash away that original sin and now leave that child in a state where they're only accountable for their own sins, hmm. mm-hmm. which will still send them to hell in a, in a yeah, Roman but, Catholic concept. Yeah. But that child un, under that philosophy has been washed away of Adam's sin. They're no longer obligated to Adam's sin. They're now part of the church uh, in, a, in a sacramental way. It's made them holy. Mm-hmm. To wash away that original sin, but now they're going to stand before God for their own individual sins. They're, they're tabula rasa. They're a clean slate before mm-hmm. God. And of course, it doesn't take long for a baby to sin against. Yes, yeah, you've been God. around children. You know, you know, it takes about twenty minutes. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, but at least <laughs> from a from a, a a Roman Catholic point of view, they have they have dealt with that original sin issue. Does this? Wow, I'm going to really derail this, but does that? Um, practice come up in the age where infant mortality was super high it it does it does and it it's um well saint augustine is the individual who goes against that whole issue so we're probably talking 800 bc somewhere Mm -hmm. in there um and uh bc or eight excuse me ad ad you know we're talking ad actually we're gonna do this right ad 800 Mm mm-hmm so we're talking about, you know, somewhere in that region of time. Okay. And uh, Augustine, of course, is a, a North African uh, bishop. Pelagius is a, uh, is a Greek bishop. Mm-hmm. Uh, conflict arises. Uh, Pelagius is actually thrown out of the church as a heretic because Pelagius, Pelagius argues that uh, babies are born without original sin. Mm-hmm. That the, the death of Jesus Christ and his resurrection makes everybody a blank slate huh. and uh our, um you know augustine augustine argues stands against up it. against that yeah um argues against it convinces the church that uh that there's a reality of original sin um and then and then the church responds kind of in an unusual way because they they liked the idea of what pelagius was teaching mm-hmm. they just couldn't embrace it because they knew that it wasn't politically correct to do that hmm. 
Um, so they embrace this concept of semi-Pelagianism where they say, okay, everybody's born with original sin, but you get baptized and it washes that and away. it washes that away. You still have, or we still have a, a remission of sin concept for Baptists, for a, adult baptism, hmm. because there's a, you know, there's a, a segment of the church, uh, the Protestant church in the United States, the, uh, the church of Christ who baptized by immersion to wash away sin. Right. This is a baptismal regeneration. Baptismal regeneration, which is not really that far away from the semi-Pelagian concept of making me a clean slate all over again. Mm -hmm. Not, not, and, and see, that's the issue. Baptism doesn't save anybody. It doesn't save a baby. It doesn't save an adult. It goes back to that work of faithfulness. I get baptized because God says do it. So it's yeah. it's an obedience issue. Yeah, and we tie that as Protestants. We tie, you know, Baptistic Protestants. You know, our tying of that is into, you know, the work of John the Baptist and, you know, particularly in Jesus, right? Like, yes. And then into the book of Acts. But if you look at the, if you look at Jesus, Jesus doesn't get saved because he gets baptized. Clean slate. He, yeah. he is the clean slate. He is no the, sin. He is the clean slate and the slate cleaner. Yes. And so you were... You know, to to go down that route of salvation through the act of baptism then becomes problematic when you look at Jesus pursuing baptism. Exactly. Um, right. right. And so we'd say, well, then it must be like, it must be an, a symbolic act that is important to God. Sure. Because um, you could get carried off into Arianism there where you're saying, oh, well, you know, the Arians. Yeah, Jesus isn't Jesus, Jesus isn't until God he's baptized. Yeah. Until he's baptized, and then the the spirit of God comes on him, and now he's right. now he's God. Well, then you struggle with this. Is why this is why Luke talks about that. You know that scene where um, Joseph and Mary have that like early parent moment, leaving their kid behind. Yeah, the church, right. right? <laughs> like those are the like I think God like, must have been a Baptist church. Yeah, yeah. I think God inserts. Um, intentionally inserts a story like that into the account of Jesus so that we don't get tempted later on down the road to assume that Jesus wasn't fully God from the beginning. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's as if God had foresight or something. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Or knew what was coming. Yeah. So anyway, so, so this is why we tie our, our baptism act into something that is symbolic because of this act of Jesus. Like he can't get saved or any of those things through the process of baptism. He's not really Jesus. Right. right. Um, and I think I have, I have baptismal regenerist friends who will yes. point to like the, the baptisms that you see in the book of Acts. Acts 2, believe acting, in the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and, you said, and, they, and, and be baptized. It says, yeah, yeah and, be baptized. and be baptized. Yeah. And you have um, the Philippian jailer or and yes. you have these other like scenes Which where is baptism often, comes immediately yeah. after salvation. Right. And they will tie those two things together as being one in the same or like a cause A, cause B, and you're not fully Christian until you've gone through those two steps. Yes. And we say, no, like those are just them immediately recognizing their need for obedience. And this is the first act of obedience right. that comes after um, the salvific act, the yes. Holy Spirit. Yeah. You know, anyway, so, so this, you know, if you're listening to this and maybe your head's spinning at this point because we've, we've touched so a lot many of different things because this should have been a podcast series. And we it's may just have come, a come back to this. Yeah. But um, you can understand why this becomes, I mean, as a listener, hope, you know, we hope you can understand why this becomes such a divisive uh, conversation because there's some room for interpretation in scripture over all of this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and we, uh, from our background, look at this word baptizo, um, which, which means originally to immerse. Yes. You know, yes. as much as they try to like, you know, write a word that gives interpretive room to create unity. It's still a Greek word that means dunk. And so you've got to kind of go back to that. And that's what we do. We look at the original word that was chosen. Yes. And we look at the way in which it was applied. And you say, well, this every time we see this word used and applied in scripture, somebody who has expressed personal faith in, in the gospel, in the work of Jesus, has pursued this. So it's after salvation. 
and they've pursued this and it means to immerse and every act that we see in scripture is an, an immersion act like we get that through th- we get that through uh, of an adult of an adult right that's what i'm saying like you've made the decision right, right. everybody in this has made a decision to follow jesus first yes. you can't do that as an infant yeah and um you you then pursue immersion and you have mikvah pools and yes. the temple mount that we've uncovered and yes. those are like immersive pools yes that's what they exist for yeah um all of these acts like john the baptist like all of these are moments of of full immersion the ethiopian eunuch moment of full immersion so we get all of those and that's why we tie that that's where we come from when we say baptize and why we believe it yes the way we do yeah absolutely but hopefully that gives you a window into why some people believe differently right um it might mean that like that conversation you have with your presbyterian friend can make some more sense like oh we do something similar we just call it something different and what do you do and you can ask them the question what do you do with somebody who becomes a believer older right you know when they're older who who didn't get sprinkled as an infant. How do you handle that? Well, what or if what they got do? sprinkled as an infant? And then what do you do? In, in Roman Catholicism, yeah. where that sprinkling was for the sake of washing away original sin, are you going to let that stand because have they been welcomed into the covenant mm-hmm. then? Or here's a, one of the other issues that comes up in Presbyterian churches, and please don't get me wrong, or I'm an outsider looking in. Right. But I think that one of the things you come up with with Presbyterian churches is you have people who have been sprinkled as babies because their parents were faithful, faithful, trying to be faithful, trying yeah. to be faithful, right? And trying to, and now you're part of this movement and this church, and very Calvinistically, we're saying, okay, so he's open to the gospel and. God is going to God is going to save him because the Philippian jailer got saved in his house and so but do you ever follow up in your Presbyterian church with that five year old, six year old, ten year old child and say, Listen, sure you got a little damp, but did you trust Jesus? Mm-hmm. And and I think that that's something that's missing. We talked about this when we were back in our our church history series. We talked about Gilbert Tennant, who was the Presbyterian pastor in uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey in this in 1730, 1740, who says, "I think it would be a good idea if we required." pastors in the Presbyterian Church to actually be saved. And there's a big battle over that. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a problem there with sprinkling a baby and saying, I'm being faithful to God. And does that carry out? And I know my Presbyterian friends are going to have a hissy fit on this, but that that's, there's, there's one of the problems that we see as yeah. Baptists. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Congregational. That's what we like. We like, the, we like, I would say the idea, but this is a, this is a pretty firm belief. Like we 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 value this as an act, a stamping or a statement on an action that has already happened. Yeah. Um. For a lot of these reasons. Yeah. Um. And you know, one of the things, the reference I use when I'm teaching people about about baptism in our membership classes, and I talk about how baptism is very similar to a wedding band, and um, if I take my wedding band off, it does not remove the covenant I've made with my wife. Um, we are still married, um, but the wedding band is an outward symbol that declares right. my allegiance to my wife and the right. reality that I am a married husband. Yep. And our our pursuit of baptism by immersion is this public declaration of something that has happened, a, a commitment, a covenant yeah. made with our Lord Yeah. that says, I will follow him and I will trust him for my salvation. Which is why we don't accept your infant baptism as baptism. Right. right. It's, one of, it's one of the reasons we encourage baptism as an adult. Like we, right. we have that a lot. We have people who come from other faith backgrounds who pursue membership within our church, and we love that. And our encouragement to them is, well, let's, let's do baptism by immersion as well. Yes. Um, I, and I'm, I'm always careful in that conversation to say, like, I, I respect your parents' desire to commit you to the Lord. And yeah. let's celebrate God's activity in your life by completing that um, that commitment that they made and you making the personal make commitment. Make it your own. And make yeah. it your own. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So baptism is a fun That's conversation. Right. It if is. If you have questions about this, you can throw in a comment or shoot us an email, podcast at marshcorner.com. Throw all of those yeah. in. Yeah. And then what we can do is when we actually do our baptism, when we do a baptism um, series. series, 
We'll try and answer your questions. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll dive into those. I yeah. love that. Sounds great. What's well, yep. today's theological term of the week? The theological term of the week. I hope you're not angry that we took so much time on that. <laughs> angry. We're going to talk about that today. That's yeah. great. I, I was just proud of myself for finding the red button quickly that time. <laughs> um, yeah, so we... Uh, we are um, working through a series in our sermons uh, this year. We're yes. going deep. We're diving deep into the discussion on the Sermon on the Mount. Right. And uh, it's it's a great place to dig in because there's so much going on in that in that sermon by by Jesus. Um, it's in Matthew, starting in Matthew five, and we uh, uh, I kicked off yes I yesterday I preached on the first example that Jesus uses to talk about this new, uh, this new kingdom ethic. I, I, it's what I called it, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, this, uh, those of us who are part of the Lord's kingdom, part of Jesus's kingdom of people, um, this is our, this is the way in which our law is defined and understood. Uh, I heard, I had a professor in college say, or seminary, I had a professor say um, that if Christians could just nail Matthew 5 through 8, uh, Matthew, you know, that, yeah. Then they would, they would probably have this whole Christian faith thing figured out. Figured out. Yep. Yeah. Like the, the, that's that's the core thing. Like, you know, whenever somebody comes to me and says, like, "What should I do now that I, you know, have trusted in Jesus?" or "What does God want me to do in my life?" I was like, "Well, are you doing Matthew five through eight? Let's start there." Yeah. Let's right? start there. Yeah. So, yeah. so it really is. It's like the. It is like the third law. It is, you know, you got numbers, you have Deuteronomy, and you have the Sermon on the Sermon Mount. Sermon on the Mount. And, and Jesus, uh, we're saying, you know, as we're digging into this, like this, that's really what Jesus is doing. He's not abolishing the law of the Old Testament. He is clarifying God's heart for it and right. explaining really how he is the fulfillment of it and how we are, right. what we're really accountable I wouldn't to. even use the word redefined. Some people like Ooh, to true. think, yeah. right, oh, Jesus is redefining the law. No, what, what Jesus is doing is he's stay, stating what God's purpose for the Old Testament law was in the very first place. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, Because you know, with, with the Old Testament law, you're really getting... You, you're you're getting the result of God's heart, right? Like yeah. It's it's like reading a modern day law book about a particular law without sitting in the session of Congress where they hammered out why that law exists. Yes. And maybe what Je and, and what Jesus is doing is giving you a window into that session of Congress on why the law was created in the first place ooh, ooh, and ooh, yeah. why. Um, why we're accountable to that original intent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was. I. That and and even that, I mean, the law you can take it places it's not supposed to go just because you have no idea what their intent was. So, mm -hmm. for example, I read this article this week that says that uh, you know Congress back during COVID, Congress passed this this law to help people who are unemployed and give them just enough money to keep them employed. Mm -hmm. I read this week that the estimate is that $80 billion of that unemployment money was illegally and fraudulently used. Uh, some of it went to people who are in Russia oh, nice. and China who just figured out how to use the system and defy the intent of the lawgivers who said we're going to help these people out financially 80 it was like it comes to like eight and a half percent of the funds that were actually spent were spent were stolen basically. were stolen yeah were stolen right because there were people who defied the original intent and they came up with their own intent mm -hmm. yeah and that's kind of what i was getting at a bit in my sermon on anger is you know you have you have the original laws, but then you have these writings from rabbis throughout the generations of Israel. You have like the Mishnah and other you know you, these stacks of writings that that go into um, areas in which that law applies, areas in which that law doesn't apply. Like there's this whole industry of teaching, yeah, um, yeah. that comes off of Numbers and Deuteronomy, right. and Jesus is really drawing this culture and by extension, our culture, back to what God meant. Right. And that's really where we're going in the, in, right. in, in the series. Like, if you right. want to know what God means, well, let's listen to G what Jesus has to say because he's God. Right. And if you haven't seen the series, you can always find it on, on our YouTube channel. Yeah. But yeah. Here's, here's the key ingredient to understanding um, the, the Sermon on the Mount, and it is that the law is given to demonstrate 
God's standard of righteousness, God's desire for holiness, and God's vision for worship. Right. And if you see those, if you come at the Ten Command, if you come at the Ten Commandments with those in mind, mm-hmm. and you come at the Sermon on the Mount with those in mind, you'll understand why God gives law in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not to make us righteous. It's to see it, see what God's righteousness looks like and what he wants of us. Yeah. It's not to make us holy. It's to demonstrate that God wants us to be holy. It's not to, uh, it's, it and worship. It's, you know, what God. It clarifies how we best worship How we God best worship and how, God. Yeah, how right. he's best worshiped. Right. So you see those in the tent, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then I took, I kind of went off of there and talked about, um, Kim said I should have done three C's, but that's not how I roll. So I should, yeah. I talked about how we manipulate what we read and what the law to, for our own comfort, convenience, and achievability is what I went with, like yeah. achievement, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Can I do this or not? Yeah. And is there a too C difficult, that says achievement? Probably. Give me a minute. I'll come okay, up with yeah, that. Yeah, right. Um, it's it's too, DNA. too difficult to accomplish, right? Um, therefore, I am going to lower the standards so that it, I can accomplish it. Yeah, right? yeah. And you know, in our comfort, like this is too, this is too challenging. I don't like this. It's too hard. So I'm going to rewrite this in a way that I, you know, that will make me more comfortable in the way I currently am. And then, you know, convenience is like this. This this is too again too difficult to accomplish. Um, you know, it, it takes me off of the course that I want to go on. And that so I want to go on, that I want to go on. And so I'm going to rewrite this and, you know, so that it, it is more convenient for me. Um, and we do this, this is this, you know, this kind of, you know, our, in our fight to be God, and instead of allowing God to be God, this is the result. Yeah. So let's focus in on that let's anger, about anger side that you were I, talking I, about on Sunday. I, I made a statement that I acknowledge it could be controversial. Um, Ooh, you instead of me today. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I so it. my statement in my sermon yesterday, um, it's Tuesday. It's it? Tuesday. My statement in my sermon Sunday. We had a um, snow day for those yeah. of you who are in Arizona or <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know yeah. places that, yeah, that don't get snow. Don't that get often. snow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, my statement the other day was that I was wondering, and this I would couch this. I wonder if. Anger, you of us using anger, uh, this you know, I'll, I'll adopt it a bit, is a bit like a toddler wearing their father's shoes. Um, yeah, where it's something, it's an it's an emotion that is a God emotion, yes. and we see that in Exodus when God declares who He is. Um, and a human emotion. It is still it's, a human emotion because yeah. we are made in God's image. Image. Right. Um, yeah. And so, you know, we'll get into that here in a second. But if, if it is an emotion that is used best by experts, which would be God, it is his emotion. That is something that we are not experts in using. Right. That's kind of what I was getting at here. Yeah. Like, I wonder if this is a God emotion that we, t- that we manipulate in a way to excuse our misuse of it. Yes. Um, yeah. That's really what I was trying to get at. Like, I, yeah. this is this is one of those emotions that we that we use poorly. And I, the analogy I used was like was go- a golfing Golf. one. Yeah. Where um, you know, like it, with golf clubs, there are there are they're made in certain ways depending on how good of a player you are. Not even how good of a player you are, just how like strong you are as a player. And they will, and equipment is adapted for your personal strength. And yes. if you use equipment that's poorly fitted to you, um, you will have a bad time. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, anger might be one of those pieces of emotional equipment that we go around misusing because we've not learned how to use it well. Right. Yeah. yeah so that's kind of the thought process. And it could be here. even linked. I mean, so I'm, I, I, the golf analogy was awesome, but it's it's anywhere. So, for example, I do a lot of cooking. Um, I, I bought a set of pots and pans hmm. uh, for my daughter-in-law one time. Mm-hmm. And I knew these pans. I had used them. Um, they were, they weren't this, you know, sometimes you can go to Walmart and you can get the, the iron stone, silver stone, black stone, basically the coated cookware that's mm-hmm. aluminum and, and, uh, you know, then you can make the next step up to the, you know, the stainless steel, but it has an aluminum core or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I bought these pans for her and they were very good pans, mm-hmm. but I also knew that these very good pans that if you were not 
For example, if, if you were the kind of person who turns on the stove all the way up to high because you don't know what you're doing, um, that these pans are going to kill you. Yeah. I mean, everything was going to stick to them. You were going to hate them. You're going to hate everything about them. And, and I, I warned her when I gave them, I said, look, I said, these are really good pans. But I said, there's a learning curve on them. Mm -hmm. I said, that, that sounds, I know that sounds odd and I know that you're a good cook, but I just want you to know these are a great tool, but they are hard to learn to use. Give yourself some time with them. Yeah. And I don't know how that goes. Maybe she'll listen to the podcast and she'll know say, how she's doing hey, them. how I are love you them. They're great. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And this kind of works across the board with a lot of tools. I, yeah. I mean, I took my, you know, we had a snow day yesterday. So obviously rather than staying home, I drove on all the sketchy roads to take my girl skiing. Because of course you will. Yeah. And uh, like I, I, I'm a good skier. My skis are um, designed for good skiers. Um, my daughters are learning and I have skis that are designed for them in their learning stages, right? Like they're a little bit shorter, they're easier to manage. Um, if I put my, you know, and they had a great time because those skis are shorter and easier to manage. And if I'd put them on race skis yesterday, they would have hated it and they yes. would hate skiing and they yeah. would think skiing is too hard and they would think it is, you know, they'd be discouraged by it and they wouldn't continue because they're not yet experts. Right. Um, and, and this is, this is one of those things I, I, I think of anger in, in, in sort of the same mindset that the anger is something that, you know, is a is an emotional tool that most of us are not equipped to handle Just well. Just not capable. Yeah, exactly. Right. You know, and what we, what we will do is we will read like Ephesians and we'll, we'll read areas uh, in scripture. We will look at Jesus's um, turning of temple tables. Yes. And we will look at God's exacting of vengeance in right. the Old Testament and in Revelation. In Revelation. And yeah. we'll say, well, this is clearly a... There are there are good uses of anger, and so now God I'm excused because God can't sin, and so now I I in my anger I am excused. Yeah, and we will behind us will leave a trail of devastation. Sure, um, because we've misused the emotion. Right. Um, my you know going back to my daughters, like I, um, I was having this conversation with my wife Kim after um you know Sunday evening, and we we're talking about times in which we become angry with our girls and um you're saying like you know a lot of times when we're trying to discipline them um we, we experience a level of frustration which every parent does with their kids and um but I, I was telling her like i i have found that i get most angry with them where i my my level of anger increases proportionally to how much their disobedience is impacting what i want to do Interesting. Yeah. Right. Like if there, it's one thing for me to tell the girls like, Hey, it's time to get going. We need to get to school on time so that I can get to the office on time. And you know, they may loiter <laughs> and may? Then they will, I know your daughters they will may. loiter <laughs> and I will, my, my frustration will them with them will increase. And it is a temptation to say, well, my frustration is justified because I gave them a rule and they disobeyed it. Um, which is true, but the level in which my, I have, you know, there are times I have to check myself. There are levels in which like, is it because they've disobeyed in a, 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 they've disobeyed me that I am frustrated and I am frustrated because sin has impacted their lives and I am, I am, I am grieved over their sin or am I frustrated because they've inconvenienced me? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. I know, I feel the pressure of having to be somewhere also. And I feel the pressure of making sure that they get to school on time so that I don't get phone calls about their tardiness. And I feel, you know, and a lot of times we'll do this uh, and we'll justify it on the back end. Well, they disobeyed me. But really, it's more than that, right? right. Like I, my, 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 the level at which my anger increased was not justified, right? So this is an issue, right? So here's, here's part of that. We're talking about anger. We're talking about possibly... Is it, a, is it a tool that God can use, mm, mm. but that we can't? That was one of the things that you said That's on Sunday. Wondering. Yeah, yeah. Right? Is this a this tool? This is a tool that God can use, and, and we just not... should not try and do this. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And, and a, part of me says, oh, that's an interesting bounce on that. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I'm saying, well, I'm made in the image of God. I have those emotions. I need to use them well. Right. 
And maybe one of the tricks here, maybe one of the things we need to put in perspective is it's what emotions am I using in combination with anger mm. that make it unusable? Yeah, that's interesting. It's it's your, your golf analogy, right? Yeah. Um, you can have an amazing swing with a fantastic club, but if you take your eye off the ball, it's not going where you want it to go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you if you set up wrong, or you know, whatever, you, right? you have to you have to train yourself to use all of those aspects of of golf. Or uh-huh. you know, like I said, if if you've got the pan, but you're doing a high heat um, with a cold piece of meat that just came out of the out of the refrigerator, you're you're you're, you're messed up. Yeah, right. So. Here's your combination. Better make your sauce better, though, because you have all those pieces. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm, mm, yeah. yeah. But <laughs> you, you're going to have, you have anger, but maybe the anger isn't the issue. Maybe the frustration is the issue. Because mm, mm-hmm. um, you, you can be angry over disobedience, but you can't be frustrated by it. Mm, mm, maybe. You know, for example, I, I don't know. Here's a good question to ask. Does God get frustrated? I guess in my imagination he does, because I would get frustrated. Yeah, that's not necessarily the right way to approach it, is it? Right? I mean, do you take Genesis I I, six, for example, where God says that uh, you know he repented of him that he'd made man? That, we'll talk about that word sometime. He repented man that he'd made man. His days were going to be one hundred and twenty years. Is that yeah. God saying I'm frustrated with the direction that this is going? Um, and so one hundred and twenty years from now, I'm destroying the entire world. Yeah, or is that that he is? Is he acting out of his long-suffering anger? Which is another piece of this. Right? Like, I think in this... Patience instead of frustration? Yeah. So that's... um, I think that's one of the big comparisons here with anger. Like, when we look at God's anger, it is, you know, he is... uh, He is slow. His nose is slow to get hot. Is the uh, the original idiom, right? Yes, yes. Um, His his nose is slow to get hot, uh, but he is abounding in steadfast love. Um, like th- that's the, that's the imagery you get in Exodus. And so, so, so God's anger is slow, a slow, patient, long suffering burn. And to the point where it gets, I, and, and then there are people who are like these like emotional stuffers who are now justifying their, sh- their like explos- right. explosions. Right. Um, yeah. but like, but God is patient and judicious with his application of anger. Yeah. yeah. That's really what we're getting. Like he, he knows the exact right moment to apply it. Yeah. And he does it after, he does it in its proper time. Yeah. Maybe anger is like exclamation points. Hmm. Like I, I, if you use 15 of them in one paragraph, it, it's probably a little too much. I actually, I actually heard, I actually <laughs> read an article that said, uh, you know, that the, you have, you have so many exclamation points to use over your lifetime. <laughs> then you're cut hey, off. Then you're then you're done. Oh man, I'm right? in trouble. So, uh, you know, so use them sparingly because you you don't want to run out. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, and yeah, maybe the anger is the same way. Maybe it's like you have so many moments of anger that mm. you can use in your lifetime. Use them well. Use them well. Don't don't blow it. Yeah. Yeah. That's man. It is. It's it's a challenging. It's a challenging conversation. This this emotion because I think there are some people. That this is their predominant um, sin, right? Yeah. Like this short fuse, they're they're p- being they're being prone to anger. Is their is their thing that they find themselves confessing most frequently to the Lord on? Yeah. And and t- so for them to hear this as Jesus's opening salvo on what it is to be in His new kingdom ethic, if that hurts. Like, yeah. wow, I have an issue that I need to repent. And I have created all of these, all of, all of, um, all of these damaged relationships in my wake because I don't have a, I don't have self-control over this emotion and I need to repent of that and repair. Isn't that the other aspect though? Self-control. It's a self-control issue, yeah. right? And that's what we see with God. God has perfect self-control because he is perfect, yeah. which means his use of anger is done so per- perfectly. Yeah. I, when I think about like the, the proper application of anger and the long-suffering nature, you know what I think of is the kid in Job. Um, there are, you know, there are three named friends. Right. Who pester Job for yes, the how majority yep. of the passage. And there are yep. these back and forth between Job and these three friends. And Job and his three friends are consistently wrong yeah. in their understanding yeah. of who God is. Yeah. To the point where when 
um, God comes in with one of my favorite passages of scripture and just puts Job and his friends in their place with yes. who he is and what his might looks like. Afterward, Job's requirement is to make sacrifices on behalf of these three friends for right. their sin. Yeah. But there's four, there are four friends hanging out, right? Yeah, there, there's Job plus these three friends plus this kid named Elihu. Elihu? Elihu? Is it Elihu? Elihu. Uh, so go look it up in Job. Write us back. Let us know it who it is. Was Eliphaz, but... um, Maybe that's the original. Maybe Hebrew. that's the King James. Yeah. <laughs> right. So you have this. You have this young guy. Yeah. Who? Um, He's just sitting there listening. Being culturally appropriate to the day. Yes. As a young man is there to listen and watch the elders argue, and yes. he is not asserting himself into the conversation to the until. You get, he's the last person to talk before God talks, right? Yeah, everybody else is yelling at Everybody each other. else is exhausted from, from this conversation. And now he speaks and he speaks out of righteous anger. And he, he really puts all four, four of them. these men in their place to say, who are you to, um, you know, to speak on behalf of God and to assume that you know how God works. Yeah. And what is telling is that God does not tell Job to make a sacrifice for him. No. No. He's the voice of God in that. Yeah. And so I see him as the proper application of anger. Yeah. Because he is patient through like 30 chapters of foolishness. Yes. Before he, in his anger, speaks to correct wrong. And then he's done. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's, you know... It gives us a picture, a, one of these pictures that we can miss if we're just kind of reading this right. on what God's long-suffering anger looks like, where it is patient, it allows foolishness <laughs> to a certain extent. You know, like um, Abraham is told in the, in the covenant that, that God makes with him that, you know, your, your descendants are going to end up in e Egypt, um, but there's going to be this time frame, you know, there, 400, 400 years, years yeah. while... Because the 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 uh, the sin I'm not of angry the Amorites with the Amorites, the sin <laughs> of the Amorites has not yet reached its point, you know, and it's going to take 400 years for me to like angrily correct them, um, like so, like God God is patient and allows this to a, to a level, and then quickly decisively acts out of his anger to correct, right. Um, Man, what an illustration that is for us, right? So, and then you get, you know, then you get the psalmist who says that God's anger is for a moment, right? But that His pleasure is for a lifetime. Yeah, right. Yeah, He doesn't. And and maybe those are some skills that we need to learn in anger. Like you can't. One of the things we talked about, right? Yeah. Just to recap, sort of, because you can't get you can't get angry and frustrated at the same time. You have to, you have to make sure that that balance. Yeah, or and yeah, and then on the other side of that you don't want to hold on to it. And then you don't want to hold on to it. And that's the Ephesians passage. Like right. the Ephesians says like in your anger do not sin and then the second part don't let the sun go down on your anger. Yes. Um or else the devil gets gets a foothold. Like that's the that's the that's the abbreviated yeah. Couple yeah. verses yeah. there, right? So again, which says like in your anger like you know, obviously you're not going to do something that violates uh Matthew 5. Yeah. And then it's going to be over. Yeah. Do not yes. let the sun go down on your anger. And a lot of us like yeah. look at, well, I think a lot of people interpret that as, I need to get this off my chest now. Now, right. Right. Like in marriage counseling, don't go to bed angry. Right. Right. Like that's the conversation that, we'll, that's the interpretation we'll have on Ephesians uh, 2 and four. Uh, four, Ephesians 4. And, uh, but the, uh, I think part, the other part of that is don't hold on to it. Don't hold on to it. So this is one of those, it's, let's, let's put this like an application of that theologically to the way a lot of people act about God. Mm. Okay. A lot of people think God is always angry with them mm. and that God holds a grudge. Sure. And, uh, you know, we haven't, we sort of, that goes back to my frustration piece. Right. God's always frustrated. Always me. frustrated. Cause I'm frustrated. Me. Cause I'm, I'm a mess. Yeah. Right. Sure. You're a mess. Yeah. A God, if God is angry with you, you will know it. Mm -hmm. It'll be clear punctilier <laughs> momentary yeah addressed and then he's done yeah he's he's waiting he'll hit it he'll be done with it he'll be done with it mm -hmm. god is not going to be angry with you forever yeah yeah 
And and I think that there are a lot of people who live their lives thinking that God just is sitting up, up in heaven, keeping a record of all of their wrongs, and he's just waiting. Maybe he's waiting for the day that he's going to zap them big time because he's kept a record of it. Yeah. Or... Or they're like, God got angry with me because I did this sin back in 1997, and God has not forgiven me of it yet. He's still angry with me, so he doesn't talk to me. And I just this is, I, I, you know, and it, which leads to some of these fun like um, projections on what eternity looks like, right? Like, you know, I remember thinking about this um, when I was younger. Like, man, the line to get into heaven is going to take forever because you have all of these people who are going to have all of their sins read out. And then you could have all of the, yeah. you know, and you could have like these, these burning parties where all of that's burned away. And then, you know, and then, you know, all of the things that are holy, like they stay like jewelry. And then that person gets welcomed into yeah. heaven. Interesting. And then it's line number three. And, and then it's the next person in line because they pulled the number out of the little yeah. red machine and then yeah. they get their thing. And no wonder eternity is eternity because just getting into heaven is going to take forever because yeah. everybody's got to have this list read yeah. and everybody's got to stand before throne of judgment and everybody's got to go through this process. And man, I I would rather just wait in line for a Disney ride than to wait in line for heaven. Yeah. This is my, my yeah. imagination. 240 minutes the other day for Splash Mountain. Yeah. Got oh, goodness. Um, so this is my imagination, right? But if, if God's anger is, but for a moment. For a moment. Yeah. Um, then perhaps that line to get into heaven is not quite so as long. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because this has been addressed. It's done. This has been it's addressed through done. my son and it is finished. Welcome to eternity. Yeah. 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 And Which is a statement about how we should handle. If I'm this. handling this emotion of hang of anger, okay. Yeah. So it it's long suffering. Mm -hmm. It lets it go. It never brings it back up again. Yeah, it's, it's done. done. It's done. Um, which means that in the moment of its application, it should be applied well, so that it can be done. Yes. Right. Like be be angry correctly in the moment and move on. My favorite. I, I wish I remembered the reference. I wish I saved this. But my favorite parenting article, one of the most informative parenting concepts that I have ever read, came from somebody who talked about the video game analogy of parenting. I may have referenced this before on the podcast, but the video game analogy of parenting. So if you if you start playing Super Mario Brothers, because that's me, right? I, that's right what I grew now. up with. Yeah. Um, start playing Super Mario Brothers, and you start by running on that little like screen with the brick on the bottom, and you run up, and there's do, that little do, row of boxes, do, do, and there's do, that, do, do. that little mushroom guy right away. Yeah. And if you hit the mushroom guy on the side instead of jumping on his head, boop, what boop, happens? Boop, boop. You're done. Immediately. You're done. And you start over, yeah. right? And then you get a chance to learn from that moment of being immediately corrected, and you move on. And eventually, if you've made this mistake too many times, the game's over. And we're going to start this back from the beginning and we're going to get this figured out. Yeah. And the, 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 the writer of that article is saying, this is how we should parent. Like in the moment of error, we immediately decisively say that's wrong. Yep. Let's start over again. Yeah. Um, and then if we keep running into that same issue of sin, we, you know, we decisively act. The game is over here. Yes. Uh, we're not going to carry this out. I'm not going to keep warning you. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to stick your nose in the corner and make you think about this forever. Like, I'm going to this. I'm going to out. decisively act in your life and say, no, this is wrong. Stop it. This yes. is what correct life looks like. This is how you jump on the head of this mushroom guy so that this no longer becomes a problem. As a parent, it's my job to angrily act with this decisiveness in the moment so that my children don't keep running into the same error. Right, right. And it is, the, it is my gift to them as a parent to decisively act in the moment to protect them from sin and so that it acts momentarily so that they can move on from that problem and face others. Yeah, and uh, you know, which may actually require some anger. Yeah, and I think that, that that's... That's the judicious application of this, um, of this God emotion. Yeah. Um, and it takes some intentionality and perhaps some practice, um, and yeah. some counsel. Um, and you know, one of the joys of doing things God's way is you get to parent with a spouse and, you know, and maybe the conversation with the spouse mm -hmm. afterward is, did I apply my anger properly here or did I act out of my own self-interest? Like, you know, how am I doing? Yeah. Um, if you're not married, if you don't have kids, like using that in another analogy, having other believers in your world who get to see you for who you are, then you can go to them and say, hey, did I, did I just act out of uh, misplaced anger or do you think that that was like God honoring 
Um, and they get to speak into that also and correct us. So let's let's a little homework assignment. So yeah. if you're listening to us, let's let's do an anger anger study, mm-hmm. right? So think about the last time you were angry, mm. right? What led into it? Mm-hmm. Um, what should you have addressed going into that anger moment that just created frustration? Mm-hmm. So you need to eliminate the frustration. So to eliminate the frustration issue and anger. What did you not address that was not anger related, but needed to be addressed before you got to anger that would have removed it from yeah. the situation? Okay. When you dealt with the anger, did you address it well? Was it understandable? Did you define what caused the anger? Did you define what corrects the situation? And did you, or, or was it all about you? Mm, mm-hmm. And then the, the last thing is, have you let it go? Because mm, mm-hmm. here, here's the thing we, here's the thing we t- teach about anger. Okay, anger, if it's not dealt with well, leads to the sin of bitterness. Mm-hmm. The bitterness says, "I'm not heard, and I'm not understood, and no one cares." That bitterness leads to malice another sin in scripture and malice says i'm going to hold this against you because i am angry with you and i will continue to be angry with you Mm. and malice because it continues to fester and grow leads to the sin of rage Mm -hmm. which says i am going to berserk all over you because you didn't respond to my anger that I didn't express well, and it's made me bitter, and it's made me hold this thing against you forever, and now I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fragment all over you, and I'm going to murder you with my words. Yeah, which is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew five. This, you know, if it's not done with correctly, this is what leads to hell. This is yeah. what leads to murder. Like, yeah. You know, eventually, you know, it, you know, Jesus has those three. Um, variations on murder and the last one you know you fool like that's that's working out of rage and um and malice you know jesus says that's what leads to the gates of hell that's what that's what leads to murder in your brother um there are a lot of marriages that have lived in this place of rage and malice yeah because yeah. anger wasn't applied judiciously yeah um and for that jesus's corrective response to that is to seek reconciliation today immediately leave everything else behind go and be reconciled with your brother if you were jesus says if you were about to be on your way to prison and you could make right the reason you were on your way to prison on the walk over wouldn't you do it right right like if if you owed somebody a debt and you had the money in your bank account and they were sending you to debtor's prison because you you know hadn't paid it wouldn't you just be like hey I'll give you the money I have it in my bank account so that I can avoid jail. Like this, that would, that's the lot that's logical for us. Jesus says, don't, don't be on your way to hell, having within you the capability of finding resolution to this yeah. problem. Every single one of, I don't want to, I want to try and wrap here a little bit. Yeah. Right. It's about that time. We're about that time. Every single one of these statements that Jesus makes has a righteousness application in it. Mm-hmm. Their righteousness application for murder is reconciliation. Mm-hmm. And you're going to find those all the way through Matthew 5. How do I show my agreement with God's standard of righteousness? And you're going to find these, in yeah. every single one of these you have heard, there's right. an application of righteousness that needs to be put into place for the true disciple. Yep. And in that, you will have, um, you will be able to understand God's heart. You will be able to be set apart in the world that you live in. Yes. You will look different than everybody else. You will be holy. Yes. And you will truly be able to worship God. Amen. Absolutely. So go. Go. Be be reconciled. Yeah. Deal with your anger. And we'll see you back here next week. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye now. You have been listening to Inside the Pastor Study Podcast with Pastors George and Jeremy Stevens. Artwork by Caitlin Gallagher, music by San Demetrius, and engineering help from Ashley Gallagher. To find out more about us, head to Marsh Corner.